Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Hi, and welcome to Shattered Reality. Uh, we are your hosts, Farusha and Kate Valentine, and we're so happy that you joined us again. Uh, and I think Farusha wants to go over last week's guest. Ah, uh, yeah. On our last podcast, we featured the very popular veteran radio host and lunar anomaly expert Don Ecker, and uh, we mostly got excellent feedback on our guest. Don is is such a sweet, down to earth guy. He's a great guy. Um, but a couple of our critics told us that we should explore the Clementine photos from the Clementine mission of NASA a little more carefully, and we will do that, we promise you. But in the meanwhile, we have some brand new news. Uh, two things have occurred on the Space Watch here that uh, are of great interest to us, both of which revolve around... Um, exobiology, actually. The first one everyone knows about, uh, that is the European Space Mission's Rosetta project, which recently landed um, an, a smaller craft called the Philae on the surface of a small two-mile comet. And uh, it is now sending back information. At first, they thought it was lost because it kind of bounced because the uh, the comet has very little gravity, but they're going to be sending back information about just what the snow of the comet is made of. And people who who are interested in exobiology, people like our good friend um, Chandra, Chandra Wickaramasinghe. <laughs> she can, you can do that. Huh? Chandra Wickaramasinghe, who. Uh, is very very interested in exobiology. He's gonna he's gonna have a field day with this. Now the second thing that happened is a little bit less known. Um, our own space agency NASA has a Mars rover. In fact, I think there are still two Mars rovers out there. Yeah. Well, one of them poured a sample from a dry lake bed. Now this lake bed has been dry for maybe a million years or so they think. And what they came up with was a fish, a fish fossil right. from Mars. looks just like a, a little fish. fish that you might find in the ocean right. on Earth. A and the time span is similar to the time when fishes began evolving here as well. Okay, that I didn't know. A and the crinoid fossils as well. Yes. Which, so it seems like there was a thriving aqueous life form. Yes, at least that, although our remote viewers tell us that there were more beings, uh, like uh, sentient uh, two-legged, two-armed beings uh, roving around Mars many millions of years ago. But back to the, the crinoids or crinoids, whatever they're called, uh -huh. I, I don't hear Those the words. Those little curly uppy things. Yes, <laughs> uh, they, there's from a time a previous on Earth, from a time previous to the dinosaurs, probably around the same time as the trilobites were around. And um, they had taken some photographs with the rover, and a lot of biologists looked at it, and they swore that they were crinoids, crinoids. Mm -hmm. And then the Mars rover went over and pulverized it. Mm. And we have to wonder why they were given the, um, the uh, order to pulverize the little crinoid. And um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big it was yeah. a big thing in exobiology at the time. But we hear very little about this. We hear mostly about Ebola and other, other things, the story of the day. The real, the real news we don't hear about enough. What, and that's why we're here, because mm -hmm. this is free broadcasting. I see. Free and open broadcasting. Okay, so I have nothing more to add to that. I think that's excellent. That's a really good catch-up. Okay. So now we have to introduce our guest who is kind enough to be with us. Yes, indeed. Our guest is Philip Smith. He is an artist with works in the permanent collection of the Whitney Museum, the Boston Museum of Art, the Dallas Museum of Art, among many other places. 
He has also been the managing editor of GQ magazine in the past. His paintings draw inspiration from his father's work as a psychic healer. And his memoir about growing up with his father is called Walking Through Walls. For more information on his book, please visit walkingthroughwallsthebook.com and his art can be seen at philipsmithart.com. And I can say absolutely that this is a thoroughly enjoyable book, uh, having read it and written about it back in 2009. Welcome, Philip Smith. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, following the, the the Mars rover is a big honor. <laughs> uh, yes, I was really fascinated. First of all, by your title. Uh, what does that refer to? Walking through walls. Well, it's it's an incident that actually happened when I was a kid. I was um, I was about fourteen, and um, I had my father was living at a you know, next door, my parents had separated and we had a little guest house on the property. And, uh, I came home one night and I wanted to talk to my father. It's great having divor- divorced parents that live next door to each other. You, yeah. each other. <laughs> it's, uh, you don't have to make play dates or anything. And, um, I just knocked on the door and no one answered. I kept knocking, knocking, knocking. And finally this guy I'd never seen before slowly opens the door. It's almost like in a, in a Frankenstein movie. Mm-hmm. And he just looks down at me and he said, your father's in trance. He's communicating with the ninth plane. And then he, he starts to close the door and he looks back at me. He said, haven't you learned to walk through walls yet? You're your father's son. <laughs> so that's where the title comes oh. from. It's about my father's miracles and about being his son. Well, he cert- obviously had a huge influence on you. Uh, can you tell us something about your dad? Oh, uh, a remarkable, remarkable guy. He um, he was born in Poland, not in this country, and he always had a sense of that there was something else out there. To me, growing up here in America, um, I thought my father was kind of weird. And, you know, <laughs> at the time in the 50s and 60s, you saw very normal type parents on television and in ads, and I wanted one of those sort of picture-perfect dads Um, I wanted, you know, I wanted to drink Kool-Aid and have Jell-O in the refrigerator, Hmm. and he was definitely not that. Um, He was an interior decorator that um, he worked for the president of Cuba. He decorated the presidential palace in Haiti, um, worked for Dean Martin, um, Walt Disney. Um, When he was a kid, he hitchhiked out to Hollywood, and he started – building and designing sets for Charlie Chaplin on the Gold Rush. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then one day, out of the blue in the 60s, he discovers that he can talk to dead people and heal sick people, and our lives just totally changed, and suddenly our house became like lords, people coming over at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And I think it's important to set the context and, and the chronology, because this was happening in the 60s and 70s when... None of this was talked about, but right. more importantly, the medical industry, let's call it, um, there were no such things as CAT scans or MRIs. There, were, there, there really wasn't heart uh, transplant or there wasn't even Lipitor. So if basically you, had, you were um, uh, diagnosed with uh, congestive heart failure or leukemia, the doctor sent you home to die. That was it. They had n- they mm-hmm. had nothing for you. Hmm. And these are the people who came to see my father. Can you tell us a little bit more about that seminal moment where he went from simply being a very creative man uh, to uh, realizing that he had these other talents? Well, it was both gradual and sudden. Um, gradual in that when I was a kid growing up, um, he was very interested in esoteric, alternative, uh, Indian, uh, all sorts of things. So, for example, when I was, I guess, in fifth or sixth grade, and my father, uh, that would be 1957. No, I mean, sorry, I was, that was, like, 1963, and he's getting up every morning and doing yoga. Now, that's... Wow, back then, that was ago. very unusual. Most people yeah. were watching Jack LaLanne. <laughs> yes, if, if they were doing that. And um, I went to school one day. We were doing show and tell, and just like you asked me, the teacher said, can you tell us something about your parents? 
I said, well, my father wakes up and he does the yoga and the uh, the pranayama. And the teacher was from Tennessee. She said, <laughs> yoga? What the hell is that? <laughs> Um, so that gives you a time period of how alien, I mean, you're talking about, um, sentient beings on Mars. I, I grew up with one um, because <laughs> on back Earth, then right? he was so strange. Yeah. Well, but, I, I want to tell you one thing, Philip, that, um, you still can't talk about yoga in Branson, Missouri. No. If you're on stage in Branson, Missouri, and you speak about yoga, somebody that I know was entertaining there and got fired really? because it was unchristian to speak about yoga in oh, Branson, Missouri. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Well, if everybody's Whoa. amazed by what you just said, but, but uh, teleport back 50 years and magnify yes. that. And yes. you get a sense of the kind of – because my father would get um, – He'd get arrested for practicing medicine without a license. He'd get oh, uh, thrown out of hospitals, sure. um, you know, and he would get calls in the middle of the night threatening his life because he was working with Satan. Oh, um, right. The oh, police boy. would sure. take him away. So if that's happening now, think about 50 years ago. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. It's so much closer. 50 years ago was so much closer to the uh, 19th century when, you know, the whole materialist paradigm took hold of our culture. Yeah, cause and effect. What was your mom like? Uh, did uh, It must have been somewhat difficult for her to uh, adjust to that. Uh, yeah, I think it was because previous to um, – uh, Basically, my father evolved into this. He, like I said, he did yoga, then he started doing macrobiotics, and he started meditating. And then, little by little, these spirit guides started showing up and announcing them oh, is that themselves it? to him. And that's how uh, he started talking to these people and taking dictation at four in the morning from them. Um, hmm. My mom, uh, you know, my father being an interior designer, they led a very glamorous life. I mean, yeah, it sounds working, like it. Yeah, I mean, they would go to Cuba for the weekend, and she'd go gambling, and he'd meet with the president over work, and, or, you know, they'd go out to uh, Palm Beach, whatever, and all of a sudden, you've got people in wheelchairs or, or blind babies coming to house at 3 o'clock in the morning, and our oh, house wow. was like an emergency room. So it was difficult. I think the transition was, she didn't really sign on for this. Um, <laughs> she supported my father and what he was going through, but it was, it was strange. It was so, it was evolving so rapidly. It was very difficult for her to kind of find her place in this, mm. were, were which you, I think is why they divorced. Were you an only child or did you? Yes. Have, oh, so, so you, I, I got it all. Oh yeah. Uh, oh. I got to see everything. There was, there was no one. And basically there was a code of silence because I knew that one, I told you the yoga story or the police, mm -hmm. so that once I left the house, I transformed myself into this appearance of a normal kid, and I pretended my father sold insurance, and <laughs> that we were like Ozzy and Harriet, yes. because I was protecting wow. my parents. And I, But when I was home, it was perfectly normal for my father to you know, know exactly what I said or did during the day, or when I got older, when I was a bad kid, and was doing some experimenting with, with, with drugs. He'd know where I hid them. And he just, it just, I became totally transparent because he, he just knew what I was thinking, what I was doing. Well, huh. I, I have to say here, Philip, that um, the way that I was drawn to you and your story and your book um, is really quite amazing. I picked it up initially back in 2009, not by accident. I went to the library, and it was a new book on the shelf, and ah, walking through walls, that sounds like my kind of thing. And I picked it up, and I read it, and if you pro possibly recall back then, I did write a blog piece that included the books that I was reading, and your book was one of the two books that I had uh, noted, and um, I had just been at that juncture to Coral Castle, and you and your father went to Coral Castle, and I grew up with my father being a psychic, though he did not work as a psychic the way your father did. He just, he made talismans, and he talked mm. to dead people, and he would tell me when I was sitting in the back seat of the car, oh, your grandfather's sitting next to you, oh, that geez. sort of thing. <laughs> and um, unlike you, though, I never wanted to be normal. I was quite happy being abnormal, and I, too, went to school for art. 
but I have turned out to be a, a, a psychic reader. And just as we were thinking about our second podcast, I found um, a note from you on my on my blog, of a, you know, a kind of cryptic little note on my blog mentioning your book. And I said, boy, that would be a great guest. Philip Smith would be a great guest for our podcast. So it was has all been kind of uh, synchronistic, we could say. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's you know, I think that this idea of synchronicity or this idea of happy accidents or whatever, I think that once you once you enter that energy stream, that it just takes you there. I, I think that these things just once you sort of agree to sign on, um, that this is this is how you see the world, this is your belief system, off you go. Well, th- that's the whole title of this podcast is Shattered Reality. Like the reality, of course, is Ozzie and Harriet. And we all know that that definitely was abnormal <laughs> because yeah. ain't nobody like Ozzie and Harriet out there. I don't think, although they they say that they themselves were pretty, ha- they pretty much lived the show life. But I don't know. Yeah. You know, I saw a bumper sticker on a car that said everybody's normal mm. until you get to know them. So oh, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, but really, I mean, for you, you were living in two realities, just as you said. Uh, you walked out, your dad sold insurance and everything was hunky-dory. And then you got home and he could. T- so he actually was so attuned into you. He knew where you were and what you were doing. Uh, that that's not always a good thing. <laughs> well, he part of it is one of the the tools he used for diagnosing people was was a pendulum. So ah, he yes. would take the pendulum, and he would he would be able to diagnose people as to what their disease was. It didn't matter whether they were in the room or if they were sitting in in Brazil. Um, but he would use that pendulum on me as well, and he knew exactly <laughs> what I was doing. Um, it's funny, no, it, growing up as a kid, uh, you do need privacy, you do need space, and, and knowing that you're basically transparent, your father, you could be doing all sorts of things, and you get home and you put on a smile, and he knows exactly where you were, what you did, but you know, as you get older, you kind of miss that. It's great to have someone looking out for you. Absolutely, but you know, of course, Philip, he's still looking out for you. Oh, there's there's no question. There's no question. Uh, do do you see like actual um, actions or uh, just a f- is it just a feeling that he's there or is there some sort of a, I don't know like a movement Essence. of uh, like I I really I agree with you, uh, Farusha, that I'm sure your dad's still looking out for you. But do you just sense his presence or is there some uh, way he lets you know about it? Um, there's a couple things. One is I, uh, for about the last year, I take dictation from him every night. I sit down and really he starts talking to me, so I start writing. Um, but oh. usually during the day, um, and he will he will kind of like tickle my my left earlobe. Yeah. And at first I thought it was a bug, and I kept swapping it away. Then I <laughs> thought maybe I had a rash. Then I thought I was allergic to something. Um, but, um, there it was. And actually on the website, you'll see, I forgot about this until this started happening to me, but you'll see a little tiny drawing that my father did of his face. It's a little line drawing Uh and on the face are dots and next to the dots are people's names. And those are the places where if, if a certain doctor in spirit wanted to communicate with him, they might tap him on the right side of his nose or just hmm. under his eye. So he had mapped this out so that he knew who was coming in because there were so many people talking to him. He wanted to make sure he knew, you know, who who was checking in. And I had totally forgotten it until I just told you this story because it's the same thing. I mean, that's, I think, why he does tap me on my left ear because that's how he was communicated with. Interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. Um can you give us a couple of, or uh, you know, stories from his life that you think are most um, uh, typical of his powers or his uh, the, his abilities that you could uh, share with our listeners? Sure. Um, well, there's one that happened to me. I at uh, let's see how I, I was 17, and I. Um, 
I had been working, you know, I guess in uh, I was a janitor or something on weekends, and I'd been saving my money. My my girlfriend at the time and I, we decided we're going to go to Europe. And back then, that's kind of what hippies did. You went to Europe, you bought a cheap ticket, you flew to Iceland, dear. Uh, I thank you. Yes, <laughs> that's that's what you did. It was I don't know, maybe three four hundred dollars or something around yeah. there. Yeah. Wow. And you took a backpack and a sleeping bag, and off you went to Greece mm-hmm. and all over. So I was go. I mean, today, I don't know that people would let their kids do this, but um, so I gave him an itinerary that we were that we were doing. And uh, we were on a train and my girlfriend at the time was Cuban, is Cuban, was Cuban and um, obviously speaks Spanish. So she, we were going to go to Paris. She said, well, why don't we go to Spain since I speak Spanish? I said, OK, so we. You know, we're kids. We're 17. We just changed our plan. We go to Spain. And um, when we got there, I, I must have eaten something or so, I don't know. I touched something, but I I got so sick in a way that I've never been before. And they called a doctor and the doctor basically thought I was going to die and oh, he no. couldn't do anything. Oh. And I was sweating. I was vomiting. I was, you know, 105 fever. Oh. And um, she's crying. We, you know, we're we're in this little pension that we're paying, you know, seventeen dollars a night for. So we're not exactly, you know, near a hospital. And um, about two three hours into it, all of a sudden, one second later, I'm just burning with fever, and then it stops. And I kind of wake up and I say, "Where am I?" And she says, "Oh my God, I thought you were going to die. The doctor was here. We couldn't revive you." And um, we went on with our trip, and when I got home, the first thing I did was I called my father. I said, hi, Pop, I'm home, and he said immediately, you know, I'm really sorry what happened in Spain, and oh. I had forgotten about the incident, and I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, you almost died. You had this horrible fever, and um, you had this horrific infection, which he said the problem is the reason you got so sick and it lasted so long is you changed your itinerary. You didn't tell me, and I got – basically noticed from the spirits that you were sick and I didn't know where you were because I thought you were supposed to be in Paris so I I took out an atlas there was no internet back then I took Mm. out the atlas and I was dowsing every country Mm -hmm. in Europe until I found that you were in Madrid you were in Spain and then I was able to kind of uh, hook into you and locate you connect with you and then I got you better but that's why it took so long and you know I'm a kid and it's like why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> oh, you know, I oh, just completely. And today, I would. I love the idea that he did that. Yeah, it's quite amazing. Uh, and it actually happened too, which I think that's. Uh, it's you know obviously it happened, but you know some of these things that you hear. Uh, that that's what's so much fun about this podcast. It's so outside anything that you typically come across in daily life. I mean, that's an amazing ability. One that he he knew you were in Spain. I mean, that alone, and two that he was able to cure you at I, that distance. I can relate to the part of it. Energetically, he couldn't find him, yeah. and and then he took the the map and doused the map like a you know. Um, like using a, a dowsing rod, but only the pendulum. Correct. Well, That's absolutely correct. Well, well, both of you are into pendulums, and I'm not. How exactly does that work, if you don't mind? Just a quick description. Well, I, uh, I just I'll start ahead. out. And yeah. um, a pendulum is uh, c- could be any weight, but mm-hmm. often it is a, a rock crystal. Right. But it doesn't have to be. It could be a fishing weight. Mm-hmm. And it's suspended on a string or a chain. Mm-hmm. And one holds the top of the of the string or chain and allows the pendulum to circle in one direction or the other, or it might uh, sort of go back and forth horizontally or vertically. And you kind of learn um, what your sign for yes is and what your sign for no is. Oh, okay. And that's the simple way that a pendulum works. Now, Mm -hmm. people who are more advanced have charts that they use, like for like you might use a Ouija board with letters, or you can douse on a map. Uh, uh, I believe that um, 
uh, not Ingo Swan. Who's the Israeli fellow? Oh, his name is on the... Oh, with the bending spoon? Yeah, the guy who bent... Yuri Geller. Yuri Geller, Geller. right. Yuri Geller purportedly douses for minerals for different mm. companies and countries, mm. uh, finds titanium deposits and things like that, and that's apparently how he actually made his fortune. Mm. But tell us more about your father in dowsing. Well, the idea is that the, the pendulum is is really it's dumb, it's inert, it does it has no magic powers. But what is hap it's a tool that as as you just said, that allows you it's almost like a lie detector test, it allow or an EKG. It allows you to see what you can't otherwise see. It's an indicator. So the thing is, once you're t and and my father would believe all, everything is knowable. You can um, uh, you can learn anything. You can determine whether uh, someone is honest, whether they've they've stolen the mo you know who's the thief who stole the money, or what their blood pressure is, or where they grew up. It's just a question of asking the right question with the pendulum, and the pendulum is there simply to sort of as a as an indicator that. It's a yes answer or it's a no answer. That you can't ask um, uh, what color dress should I wear today because it, it's not really suited for that. You have to ask yes or no. Should I wear a green dress today? Okay. No. Should I wear a red dress today? Yes. And basically, you always uh, you work in, in a yes or no, almost like compu computers work that way. It's yes, basically binary. binary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, fascinating. Thanks. Thanks. Because I'm sorry, I had been aware of. What what that was used for? So so, what else did your father diagnose? I mean, many oh, things, I'm sure, but yeah, I don't think there the, well there wasn't a disease that he didn't diagnose. And again, going back um, to the time period, you know, for example, um, unlike today, where they'll do a PET scan and they'll inject you with radioactive dyes, and if there's tumors, they'll they'll light up under this um, PET scan. Uh, th there was none of that diagnostic technology back then. So um, if they thought you had, let's say you had maybe they think you had colon cancer, what would happen is they would see a shadow on an x-ray, or if you, they think you had lung cancer, they might see some shadows in your lung, but they didn't know. Um, so what they would do is they would do something called exploratory surgery and just cut you open and look around. Um, he was able to completely avoid that. He was able to know definitively if you had cancer or not, where the tumor was, how big the tumor was, was it one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, um, whether it was going to metastasize or not, and then he could use the pendulum to determine what modality of healing he was going to send you. And unlike other healers, you know, a lot of healers today, whether it's Reiki or other things, they basically will just you know, send very good energy to someone, whereas my father wanted actually to diagnose. And if someone came in and said, I'm not feeling well, he just didn't want to say, well, I'm going to send you some healing energy and let's call it a day. Um, and he would do what was fascinating. What I loved uh, was he was able to do sort of um, psychiatry on people in about uh, two, three minutes, which if they had a good psychiatrist might take 30 years. And I'll, t I'll tell you one story. Um, a woman came in, and um, she had breast cancer. So, you know, what do we do today? We give toxic chemo, we give radiation, and then we chop off the breast. Okay. It's all pretty barbaric. Um, and so uh, my father, in certain cases, he could he could learn to – send whether psychically it's homeopathy or box flower remedies or color or energy but sometimes he felt he would determine with the pendulum and his charts that unless he knew the cause um, he, no matter how healing many healings he did this person was not going to get better unless they got to the root cause so what he was able to do with the pendulum was and let's use this woman as an example um, he he discovered that for, for the healing to take place, he needed to discover the root cause. So he wanted to know, is it a traumatic event? The pendulum said yes. And what year did it happen? So he would have a chart with some numbers on it, and we'd go down and, uh, you know, let's say the pendulum started indicating 1960. And he'd say, okay, what month in 1960? And he'd go down the calendar and May 1960. 
and then he'd say, what day? And it would say the 22nd. So he'd say, um, you know, what happened to you May 22nd, 1960? Because this seems to be the origin of your disease. And the woman started crying. She said, well, that's the day my father raped me. Oh, boy. And he said, oh. well, this, this is the origin. We need, we need to um, remove that trauma, erase that trauma, because no matter whether I heal you or you go for surgery, radiation, whatever, you're never going to get better because you have, you have this horrific psychological wound. Now, this woman normally would have to go to a psychiatrist and talk about it. How do you feel about your father? Well, I'm angry at my father. Well, do you feel you could forgive him? No, I can't. And it would just go on and on at, mm -hmm. you know, $350 an hour. Um, <laughs> but my father would kind of shortcut that, get it done, and say, we're going, and then he would erase that, that, the trauma, and then he was able to go in and start healing. That, that, that's phenomenal. So that, it really uh, speaks to how disease is not psychosomatic, but psychogenerative. It's something that correct. occurs in our yeah. spirit, a, a spiritual wound, if you will, that will cause us to develop a disease a, a, in time if we don't take care of it. Yes, and um, it's, it's, uh, I've studied karate for 20 years, and it, 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 my, my teacher, who's a great, great master, one he, during his lectures, he did he drew a picture of a bridge, and uh, spanning two two cliffs, and he said, "Here's this big steel bridge." And then he took some chalk and he made little specks all over it, and he said, "This is rust, and these little tiny specks of rust can bring down this massive steel bridge and make it collapse." And he said, "The, the speck, these specks of rust are like negative emotions in your mind." And whether it's jealousy or anger or hatred or fear, um, depression, all of these little specks, these negative thoughts in your brain, in your mind, start to create this, this havoc. And, yes, you're absolutely correct. And, and one of the things we do need to do, and it's really hard given the news that's out there and, you know, our, day, our very high-pressure lives, is to keep our thoughts scrubbed and clean and on a very positive level. Yes, yes, you're correct. And um, not only that, but um, what happens is that our thoughts are very repetitive. Each and every one of us, uh, though we sometimes read books, we listen to podcasts, watch movies, and may get different thoughts from outside of us, within us, in our psyche, every single one of us has a voice speaking to us. And it, it repeats the same things every day. Um, it's, it, we don't have like every thought is not a new thought. So we have to be really, uh, really scrupulous, as you were saying, and make sure that when we, a negative thought comes up that we replace it with its positive uh, opposite. Yeah, and it's and that's a, that's actually the hardest work to do of any any kind of um, discipline is to really during the day because we get so busy with work or you know engaging just even doing chores or going to the supermarket and someone cuts in line in front of us or the 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 cashier just throws the change at us. It's very hard to, to kind of keep resetting that compass and keep it clean and keep it straightforward, but it's it's an essential, essential duty that we have to each one of us. I want to interrupt you here just mm -hmm. to say that your book, your wonderful book, and it's very entertaining, it's very buoyantly written, it's got such a nice style. Your book is called Walking Through Walls, and um, it's available, I assume, uh, at Barnes & Noble and through Amazon, and it's available through your website, Walking Through Walls wallsthebook.com, I hope. And I am speaking now uh, to Philip Smith and his father, whose name we omitted from mentioning was Lou Smith. Yes, we thank you. We never said that. And it's my fault as well that we didn't mention Well, you're going to hear about name. it. Yeah, you'll hear about it. Your <laughs> left ear is going to be. Yes. <laughs> so another thing that um, came up, it was there were so many synchronicities in, uh, from the time that I first picked up the book, including the Coral Castle picture, and am I having just been in Coral Castle and been so impressed by that structure and, and, and that man putting it together, uh, you know, by himself, a little tiny Hungarian man, I think. He just put mm -hmm. that whole thing together on it, by himself through some very interesting uh, power and uh, 
spinning things on points and very, very interesting place. If you ever get down to Florida, listeners, you should check out the Coral Castle. It's a marvelous, interesting, uh, really anomalous spot. Um, But the other thing uh, in your life which mirrored mine was the Sophie Bush connection. Now, I'm going to take a moment here to tell you that um, growing up, Sophie Bush was like a family fable. I didn't have any idea whether she was a real person or not, Um, but my grandmother and my mother and my grandmother's sister-in-law, who was about my mother's age, they would go, when I was a little, little child, before I can really Mm. remember, they would go to see Sophie Bush. And before I was born, before my mother met my father, my mother went to see Sophie Bush, and Sophie Bush gave her my father's initials, Mm. all three initials, not just the first Mm. and last initial. So uh, Sophie Bush, she was like a legendary character in my life, and it wasn't until I read your book that I Mm. realized, wow, she was a real person, and other people know about her. (laughs) And um, can you tell us about your father's relationship to Sophie Bush and who Sophie Bush was? Sophie was, uh, and again, uh, I'm sorry to keep harping on this, Go, you have to go back 40, 50 years at a time when, um, you know, Oprah wasn't having psychics and spiritual uh, people on her show, so there was no knowledge of this, and all of this was sort of underground, and in in a very, very poor part of town, Sophie had what she called a church, and uh On Sundays, um, and also going back in time, Miami was just coming out of segregation, and it was still in many ways segregated. It was still um, one bathroom for colored, and and this is in my lifetime, and, you know, then bathrooms for white men and white women. But at Sophie's Church, which was in a black section, um, you'd have – it was it was totally mixed. Everybody came to see her. And basically what she would do is she would lead you through a service and she would send out her helpers with, uh, you know, now there's calculators, but in the old days there was, was adding machine tape. They would go out with a roll of adding machine tape and you raised your hand and they would tear off a little piece and hand you a pencil like those pencils in a library. And you would write down a question and your initials on it you would roll it up into, you know, almost look like a tiny white cigarette, and you'd put it in this pegboard that they, they passed around. And then Sophie would start lecturing, and I think basically – I was 16 at the time, so my sense is she, she started sort of working herself up into a trance, and she would put her hand out and grab one of these little rolls of paper. She would never open it. She would hold it up for everybody to see that the roll of paper was in her hand, and basically she would read – what was on what was written on that piece of paper, and then she would answer your question. Hmm. So the fact that your 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 parents went there, this is what they experienced. I see. Um, they would they would they were writing questions if if they did or they they were just observing. But if if your mom got your father's three initials, she probably wrote something to Sophie saying, you know, am I going to meet the man of my dreams, or what is the name of the man I will marry, whatever it is. And Sophie then held it in her hand, never opened that paper, held it up, and then said his initials are whatever they are, and, uh, you know, SWJ or something. And she would um, – that's how she worked. And she didn't take all the pieces of paper, but she would take um, – she would do like 15, 20 readings in, in that service. There was no air conditioning. There were, uh, you know, one or two fluorescent lights in, in the ceiling. It was very poor. There was no money. And then, you know, people would put a quarter in the hat or 50 cents in the hat, and that was it. So it was like a, basically it was a spiritualist church ceremony. But yes, that's basically. correct. And, and, that's correct. And, and can you tell us how your father, um, you know, how you and your father figure in with Sophie? My father used to go a lot um, – because, as I said, he was evolving, and he was somehow – I mean, his synchronicity was that these, these things, these opportunities, and these people and these experiences were opening up for him. So he so – who knows how he found this place? But he took me there twice, and um, I was 
16, uh, 62, so 1968, um, and, um, it was just fascinating to me. I mean, I've never forgotten it, and, and it's described very vividly in the book yes, because it, is. it made such an impression on me. Yes, it's 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 very it's a very well written, uh, very well written account of your life with your parents. Um, is there uh, any other um, uh, uh, one other thing that comes to my mind is that some of your paintings. Um, and then some of the little charts that your father made, there seems to be some connection between those two things. Is there not? Yeah, I think totally. I think that, um, I don't think that, uh, how do I say this nicely? I don't think I'm my own person. I think I'm my father's son. And um, my work is, however it's evolved, my, my painting work, I should say, is um, totally connected to his metaphysical interests, and always they're very, they're like hieroglyphs or pictographs, and they tell sort of metaphysical stories, um, and they come to me in ways that are just surprising, and they they appear they're almost like automatic writing, um, and you'd think that maybe I'd make very brightly colored abstract paintings or I'd make landscapes. No, I ended up making these these hieroglyphs that tell some sort of story and I do think it, it comes it, it it totally comes out of him. Yeah, I like I like your work very much and um Thank you. I find that um the messages are not something for the most part that I can enunciate, but rather it's it is a story and it is subliminal and it gives mm -hmm a kind of a um an atmosphere that means something but it's not uh it's not l readily spoken about that's perfect you got it <laughs> it is it is it, it's an experiential uh painting and uh, people say well what does it mean and you know by the time i talk about it, it sounds so mundane but i think when you look at the work you do have an experience and you know, in, in Tibetan culture, uh, a lot of times the priests, uh, the artists there who work for the priests, they make these Tibetan tankas, uh, which are pictures of Buddha's life. And the idea is that they're not just pretty pictures of Buddha, but actually they're imbued with a kind of energy. And the idea is that you come to them almost like you come to an oracle, and they'll, they can give you a healing, they can answer a question, they can give you insight, spiritual enlightenment. So these, these, these painted images are actually very much alive and very active. And I don't, I don't want to um, make the leap that I'm like these priests or I have their same energy or power. But I think part of my intention is I'm just not making a picture, but I want the picture to also be able to transfer energy to the viewer. Well, I think that you've done a good job of that. Thank um, you very much. I do. Uh, I would like to, to hear perhaps, uh, wh while we have a few moments left, um, some something else from your father's life that you think that our uh, listeners, something anomalous, something that our listeners would like to hear, and, you know, hopefully they'll run out and buy your book. I mean, I, I, certainly, I certainly enjoyed it. And what was the title of that book again? The title of the book is <laughs> Walking Through Walls. Right. You, Walking you know, Through Walls. A uh, memoir by Philip Rand Smith. And uh, it's published by Atria Books, which is. But it's a available part through Amazon, of, I'm sure. Of uh, Simon yeah. Schuster. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Simon Schuster is good. Uh, you know, two things really strike me speaking to you is that you come from what really would have been considered a very uh, out there background, and you sound like such a really funny guy and just a really interesting person to Down talk to, to. Very, yeah. You know, I was sort of expecting a, I don't know, sort of a little bit of an out there sort More of flamboyant a, in some way. Uh, Perhaps. Less flamboyant, <laughs> but no, you sound great. Uh, so congratulations to your parents on being successful, and you sound very happy. And I think that's an, an ideal that's way to live, um, uh, you know, uh, in the house next door to one's spouse, whether, you know, uh, unfortunately your parents divorced. Mm. But, I mean, I, I like the idea of a separate areas um, to live in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of you have less fights that way, I think. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I want to give some credit to my mom because my mom was on the other side of the fence and she was making sure that she, she, as much as my father was taking me to other planets, she wanted to make sure that I could navigate planet Earth. So she was, she was giving me the reality factor as well. And I think that part of the way that I've been able to, aside from her, her teaching and, and raising me, she did a phenomenal job under really tough circumstances, was the 20 years that I spent in the dojo because in, in karate you really learn, um, in real traditional karate, it's really about you're training your own ego as opposed to, yes, you're learning to fight, but the person you're fighting is your own wild ego. So thank you for that compliment. And, and also about your mother, I have to say that she sounded like a real fun person, like the kind of person that someone like me would love to go on a vacation with who <laughs> w hit the hot spots and um, yes. enjoyed good food and dressed very nicely and, and taught you all kinds of the ways of the world so that you could be a very urbane and a cosmopolitan fellow in New York City for a while and, and all of that. I, I kind of laid that on your mother's uh, 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 your mother's teaching. Yes, no, that's absolutely correct. Um, and uh, she was in, even though they divorced and separated, and and it was she was very proud of my father and what she he did, and um, she never uh, spoke disparaging of him, and she she was always proud that he was a healer because, listen, this is something that you yeah. really he had a tough life. This is not like today where. You know, if he were around today and had been on Oprah, he'd have a nice CD set out. He'd have maybe a nice TV show, mm -hmm. on and on and on. Um, this was tough sledding back then because people were calling him crazy. They were attacking him. It was very, very difficult. I, you know, one point that you brought up, you said your mom taught you how to navigate here on Earth. And um, I, I had, at one point had a UFO show, and uh, I was just wondering, did he ever speak about beings on other worlds or other planets or anything of that nature? You know, what's really interesting when you ask, you know, how this evolved, I found a diary from him when he was, um, I think he was around... 1819 and 1921 and in this diary um, he would record his dreams and um, he started seeing very strange creatures in these dreams who were coming to him and talking to him and he mm -hmm. would describe these creatures um, and again this is this is a well, we're we're almost heading into 2015. This this is like 90 90 something years ago. Um, but in the, in this diary, what was fascinating to me is that um, he would record his dreams, and he recorded a dream about that he saw a train crash in the desert, and he heard children screaming and saw fire. And then you turn the page of the diary, and the next morning he wakes up and he says, you know, I went downstairs and got the paper. And in it, the front page news was there was a train crash in Nevada and 13 children died in a fire. Wow. So I think these creatures were coming in and they were, he really believed that these people would come and sort of um, could, could sort of um, rewire your brain so that you would be more receptive um, and sensitive. But he also felt that he was no different than anybody else. He was not some guru or like, oh, man, I'm a psychic. He was just a regular guy, and he said, you know, these abilities I have, you have, you have, you have. Everybody has these. I'm no different. I'm not weird. I'm not special. You all have this stuff. So, um, you know, and he really, his, his real mission, and unfortunately he was too early, he really wanted to teach doctors um, how he did this because he wanted to help save lives. He never charged for healing, um, he wanted, he felt that, and especially back then, drugs were much more toxic. I mean, they're pretty toxic now, but I think they were, they were much cruder back then. And he thought they were all unnecessary. And it was a question of, of, of revamping our, our mental ability, removing the trauma and, you know, bringing the body's energy patterns up, up to, up to code, so to speak. And we would not, have this disease, and he really wanted to give the doctors this as, a, as one more piece in their toolkit. Well, that's that's wonderful, and uh, I think it, it's a, certainly a noble 
a noble uh, calling. It's been a long, hard slog for people who have tried to do that in, in, in current day. I mean, we have, you know, Barbara Brennan, who has a healing school, Hands of Light, and she has worked with a lot of nurses um, and, and given them certain um, healing practices that have helped assuage the pain of people and kind of as a complementary practice in hospitals it seems to be mm -hmm. more accepted now mm -hmm. but certainly it's it's it seems pale in comparison although it does an enormous amount of good work i'm not i'm not putting it down by any means but it seems like your father wanted to do even so much more than that yeah and we are we well, listen we're, we're we're further advanced than we were we're on the road we're you're doing this show you're each doing your own work and i think that but boy, you know, sometimes there's there's just such astonishing darkness out there in the world that you read in the news, and it's very hard to stay focused. And I really feel that everybody listening to this, all of us have a responsibility to to stay as possible, uh, as positive as possible, to be as kind as possible, and to just just keep that that thought process really clean. It's important not only for yourself, but it's important for all of us here. Yes, I agree, and, and practice acts of loving kindness wherever you go, and uh, that's the best we can hope for, right? Yeah, because negativity is so contagious, and you see that, you know, easily in a crowd, like I said, if the, if the cashier throws your money at you or was rude to you, and then you get in the car and someone cuts you off, and then you start honking, and you get out, start screaming. I mean, and then that person, it's just a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. And I know I read a book many years ago by the Dalai Lama, and they asked him, what is the biggest problem facing the world today? And he said, anger. And boy, is that ever true. Yes, anger is, is um, it's uh, all about us being here on Earth like angry apes with guns, and that seems to be <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Stanton <Stick>. Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the the big issue on earth today um so in 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 wrapping this up w what are you doing currently is is there something that we should know about that uh, you know moving forward with your life now is there a new project is there a, a painting exhibition uh, do you want to go through your um your uh, uh places on the web would you like to uh, repeat your uh, contact information we can do all of that. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, the, the paintings, and I, I love people looking at the paintings. They're at philipsmithart.com, and it's Philip with one L. Um, the book, the book uh, um, website is actually like a little museum to my father. You can see the dictation that he took from the spirits. You can see some of his healing jewels. Excuse me. Um, you can, uh, and unfortunately, it was a time when there were, we really didn't have video cameras, so I don't have video of him. You can see some pictures of him. But you can learn a little bit more about him at walkingthroughwallsthebook.com. Um, I'm slowly, too slowly, but I am working, going through all his papers and his audio tapes and working to put together um, a book on his healing methods. Um, it's long overdue, and it's going to take a lot longer because um, there's so much information, and it's it's hard writing this sort of textbook of of, of a healer who's not here necessarily to, to help me, but he seems to be helping me because when I write stuff, um, I'm thinking, gee, where did this come from? It's this doesn't mm -hmm. sound like me. So I think that um, uh, we're 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 working on this together. And it's going to be a while. I don't think it's 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 not out for next Christmas. I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. But, um, uh, I am working on it. Well, good. That sounds very good. And I I find it fascinating that you are basically doing a, I guess you could say a form of automatic writing, taking this dictation from your father, mm -hmm. and um, uh, that's that's a psychic, a psychic skill, a psychic art all in itself. And I I do get the definite impression that you are a very intuitive gentleman. I, I don't know whether you would describe yourself as a psychic, though I'm sure, I mean, you could if you wanted to, but uh, certainly a very intuitive man. And um, I can only say thank you so much for, um, for gracing us this evening with your, um, your work and um, all the wonderful things we've learned. 
Yes. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure, and you're spreading the word, which is important. Well, I, I really appreciate your being here, too. You were one of the, I would say, most fun interviews we had, too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Really? I appreciate that. That's kind of okay. Well, listen, thank you, and I hope this goes out to a lot of people, and, and keep up the good work, because what you're doing is really, really important. Thank well, you, Philip, and we'll be in touch. Thanks okay, again. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. You, huh? I, what a I, nice man. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, it was a little bit different too, other than topics that we don't always touch upon. It was great. Yeah, I really like that. He's so well spoken. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now comes the time of the show mm -hmm. called "My Friends Do Stuff." They write books. They have <laughs> projects. And the first thing I want to talk about is uh, my friend Sharon Smith. Uh, she has a uh, a spiritual road trip movie, and it's called Saturn Saved Me. And it's about her experiences in India mm -hmm. on the bumpy road to wisdom. Mm -hmm. Where, where's wisdom? Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's one of the towns in there <laughs> next to New Delhi. Uh, Sharon has visited Indian astrologers and healers, and she had to look for an ancient palm leaf that would reveal her destiny. Mm. She discovers that her past life deeds are preventing her from being happy Bummer. as well as keeping her single. Mm. And what's more, mm. she has a curse. A curse? Yes. Oh. Yes, indeed. As she a contemporary <laughs> American woman, her predicament is both humorous and uh -huh. poignant uh -huh. as she confronts the collision between Western values and Eastern ancient eastern beliefs uh -huh. well the whole uh, well, the whole thing is this sharon has filmed this whole movie uh -huh. and now she's funding money on the crowdsourcing platform indiegogo to finish this film okay um there are some great perks she's offering including mini astrology readings and a ticket to the screening in january in new york city hmm. i have known sharon for over 20 years and i can vouch for the fact that this is a worthy project okay so if you're interested, it's very funny. Please visit www.saturnsavedme.com to watch the trailer and perhaps con contrib contribute. It's every little bit helps, even if it's only five bucks. Everything helps. Okay. And on a just further with this, my friends write books. Mm -hmm. uh, the Vegetarian Flavor Bible by Karen Page mentions me, Ferrucha, as having led her to a vegetarian eatery in New York City, mm -hmm. La Francia, which she thought she wouldn't like. But after eating there, she was very pleasantly surprised. This was a number of years before the book, which is just coming out now, and before she became a vegetarian. It's a wonderful book for those who follow a vegetarian or a vegan diet, and also for those who are trying to cut down on animal product consumption. Want to save those little pussy cats and yeah, cows and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a thick book. It's just incredibly, uh, uh, like it's got so much information in it. The sumptuous photos are by Karen's very cute husband, Andrew Dornenberg. Now, this is the last book to talk about, okay. and it is quite something interesting. But in a strange little weird way, it hits upon what Philip Smith was talking about. Uh, taking synchronicity. Synchronicity, automatic uh -huh. writing. And a, a very lovely lady who is a good singer named Diane Waybright, who is a friend of mine as well, she wrote a sweet little book called, of all things, now mm -hmm. this is odd, The Burping Bottle Discourses. It's just a, a very charming little book. She wrote it. She illustrated it. And it's a very gentle introduction into the idea that you can write things that are channeled lightly. Um, and so she, she had a bottle of water uh -huh. when she was living in the desert. And it started to burp one day after she had this bottle, you know, like one of these reusable water bottles. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it started to burp. She would used it for a couple of months before this. <clears throat> and as it started to burp, she realized that it, it was telling her stuff. So she started to ask it like yes or no questions. Mm -hmm. And then she found it to be like um, a push to write. And she would write things that she felt were like spiritually channeled, but not like my name is Orc from Mork, and I'm telling you, but more like gentle spiritual advice. And it's just a, a, a very sweet little book called um, 
the Burping Bottle Discourses, published by Hermes House Press. So, so we had a vegetarian book followed by a burping bottle. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah, my friends mm. are weird. Synchronicity. I give, <laughs> I give you that, my friends are weird. So mm-hmm. in finality here, just yes. about to say goodbye, right? Yes. We invite you, gentle listener, to suggest guests for us, submit experiences of the paranormal, and most of all, like our Facebook page, which is called Shattered Reality Radio Station, because Facebook has no podcast designation. Oh. So go to Shattered Reality, the radio station, not the rock band, and like our page and our website, shatteredrealitypodcast.wordpress.com. We do and we will answer comments. Absolutely. And uh, until next time, Farusha, I will say goodbye and good night. Adios, amiga. Adios. Shattered reality.